Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Repeated punches to the face and the back of a head of the pregnant woman, handcuffed, all caught on camera. This footage led to the firing of San Antonio police officer Elizabeth Montoya. Now today, during day two of her arbitration, Chief William McManus said that Montoya has no place in his department. Dylan Collier has more on how the past conduct of other SAPD officers could give McManus no choice but to bring her back. With San Antonio Police Chief William McManus seated and ready to testify Thursday, fired officer Elizabeth Montoya got a huge win right out of the gate. Her attorney successfully argued that discipline briefings of 17 other SAPD officers who were suspended but not fired for their treatment of suspects should be admitted as evidence. Montoya was fired in early 2019 after department video showed her repeatedly punched suspect Kimberly Esparza in the head while trying to search her for drugs near downtown the previous summer. McManus described Montoya's physical actions as retaliatory and that her language toward Esparza if you kick me again, I swear to God, I'll break your arm. is not what his department is about. And watching this video, if I had to do this over again, I'd de indefinitely suspend her again. This is entirely uncalled for, and that's why she got terminated. After the city rested its case, former union president Mike Kelly took the stand and criticized the chief for failing to offer Montoya retraining or a last chance agreement to stay with the department. His uh, um, um, decision making and, and all aspects of it are not without without uh, judgment. Whether Montoya was overly punished by McManus will be a key issue for the arbitrator to decide. So will her use of closed fist punches. The city has now provided a witness who said those punches were not appropriate, while Montoya's side has provided expert testimony that they were. Reporting downtown, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. So Montoya's arbitration will likely conclude by midday tomorrow. A man is recovering in the hospital this evening after being stabbed during a domestic dispute. This happened around 1140 last night at the Villas del Cabo Apartments. That's in the 9400 block of Fredericksburg Road. San Antonio police say a man was stabbed by a woman during this argument. The man was taken to University Hospital for his injuries, is expected to recover. Officers say the man was being uncooperative. It's unclear if any charges are expected to be filed here as this investigation continues. Tragic. You know, you really have to feel for the people who lived at a trailer home in East Bear County because everything is gone after a fire destroyed their home. It happened around 10 o'clock last night at the Windmill Heights RV Park in Atkins, Texas. Fire officials say that when crews got there, the trailer was just it was just up in flames and by now it's gone. The owner says that they were visiting San Antonio when that fire broke out. It's unclear at this point how it started. San Antonio police releasing new video tonight in connection to a murder that happened earlier this month. 40 year old Scott Carter was shot and killed outside of his home in the 500 block of Storywood Drive on March 11th. Here's that video. Police say Carter was leaving for work around 640 in the morning when he was approached by a man. That man had been dropped off by a black Ford truck with chrome wheels and a running board similar to this one. SAPD says the suspect shot Carter and left with the driver of that truck. Anyone with any information, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Day three of the capital murder trial for Larry Moore. He's accused of the 1987 murder of 25-year-old Diana Lowry. Moore was indicted for that murder decades later, and today the jury learned that the victim's cause of death and the DNA evidence in that case. Our Erica Hernandez has been following this trial, and she has more on what this new evidence revealed. It was an autopsy that was done in 1987, but former Bear County Medical Examiner Dr. Robert Bucks was able to look back at his report and tell the jury that Diana Lowry's cause of death was strangulation. Internally, there was a hemorrhage on the larynx and the larynx is your voice box. After that testimony, a forensic serologist took the stand to explain comparisons done in testing between potential suspects and that of a sexual assault kit that was done on Lowry. Of all those DNA tests and comparisons done, there was one match. Larry Moore is not excluded 
as a donor of the Y chromosome. It means that the Y chromosome type from Mr. Moore does match. That analysis was done back in 2005 and Moore was indicted then, but the charges were later dismissed. But in 2018, the case was reopened and Moore would be arrested and charged for Lowry's murder. In 2020, one more analysis was done to make sure Moore was in fact a match from that sample taken in 1987. The typing results are 780 quintillion times more likely if they originated from Diana Lowry and Larry Moore. The trial will continue tomorrow morning and is expected to go to the jury for deliberations. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Now to the latest on Ukraine. During today's NATO summit in Brussels, President Joe Biden announcing an additional billion dollars in humanitarian aid to Ukraine, as well as opening borders to refugees. World leaders also unveiled their plan to fight Moscow. More sanctions are on the way to hit Russia's economy, and also allies are sending additional military assistance to help Ukraine. Putin is getting exactly the opposite what he intended to have as a consequence of going into Ukraine. A U.S. official says Ukrainians have pushed Russian troops out of Kyiv. The Ukrainian Navy also says it has destroyed a Russian warship, a symbol of hope and defiance a month into this invasion. Now back here at home, they are not Ukrainian. They don't even have any family in that country or Russia. Their only connection to the war is a human one. A couple from Austin and their friend in L.A. saw the war unfolding, and they just couldn't sit by and watch. On day five, they flew to the Polish-Ukrainian border, and they just figured out how to help. As Courtney Friedman explains, they've now raised more than $600,000, thanks in great part to the power of social media. By the fifth day of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, bags were packed and flights were booked. AJ Forsyth and Summer Vaughn left Austin and Max Rance McDonald left Los Angeles with one-way tickets to Poland. We're at the border right now. You can see it in the background. There was hundreds of like mothers with their children walking across the border after having walked quite literally miles because all their cars died while they were waiting in line. And like, I, I like, I cried. The three drove down the entire Poland-Ukraine border and quickly realized the problem was logistics. So they combined their business, nonprofit, and social media backgrounds, set up this office in Warsaw, and got to work. We're now close with the, the leaders of all six checkpoints, and they text us and they say, hey, we need X, Y, and Z. And then we just jumped on social media and looked for donations. He credits the success with what he calls radical transparency through social media. If you donate your money to us now, you trust us, you see us using that money. These pictures and videos flood their social media pages daily, prompting thousands of donations that now total around $600,000. It caught the attention of a social media team from Yes Theory. They have around 10 million uh, followers. When they post out and they say, hey, we have a need for uh, bed sheets. Uh, and then someone from D Denmark who follows Yes Theory will be like, I, I can bring 100 bed sheets tomorrow. And Big life-saving shipments, like this massive donation of generators. We got IV fluids, uh, syringes, uh, sterile gauze. But also small, impactful deliveries. This amazing woman who is leading the volunteer group, um, her first request was for these candy lollipops for the kids. We bought a whole bucket. <laughs> uh, as many as we could, we went to all these stores, and, and the kids were just ecstatic. The refugees see their kids smiling for the first time in a while. The team has seen unmeasurable pain, heartbreak, and sorrow. But they've also seen so much kindness love and hope. This is the first time that like Republican and Democrats don't matter. Like uh, religious beliefs don't matter. G uh, locations that you live in don't matter. It, it's a reminder to all of us that we are one human entity. And that is worth fighting for. The group's future is up in the air right now, depending on how long this war lasts. Still, with their success and their deep connection to the cause, they plan to be there at least another couple weeks. If you'd like to donate or learn more, head to their website, teamukrainelove.com. In the newsroom, Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam here at home Ooh. this evening. 79 degrees right now after a pretty cool start. Yeah, and now, okay. yeah, winter going to be an issue, right, Adam? Well, they, they were an issue all day today. We had the red flag warning. Still about 50 minutes left on the red flag warning, but 
the winds will quickly subside. But you take a look at our maximum wind gust today, 36 miles per hour measured at the International Airport in town. The more recent wind gusts have been closer to 20 miles per hour. And you look at the red flag warning. It's a good portion of our area locally and westward, even stretching down to the coast, but it's only until 7 p.m. So not much time left on that. As for the wind gusts the rest of this evening, just a few hours and you're not even going to notice the wind by 8 o'clock. Maybe some gusts up to 10 miles per hour, 9 o'clock, 5 miles per hour, pretty much becoming calm later on tonight. But temperatures, they're going to creep up on you again. Another cool start to the day tomorrow. Tell you how cold and where in just a bit and how much our afternoons warm up in a bit. Yeah, Adam was just talking about the red flag warning between that and the drought that we've been seeing. It's really those types of conditions that make firefighters super nervous. Now, luckily, so far, so good. We haven't seen any large fires at this point, but Bear County fire crews recently started coordinating and working together just in case a fire breaks out. The district chiefs up manpower and also uh, strike teams on the east and west side of the county. Each team has four to five trucks ready to go in case of an emergency. Basically, the strike team will go and assist that department wherever it is instead of depleting the whole area from resources. So luckily today has been a slow day, but we all know that can change in a moment's notice. So leaders are reminding people not to drag chains while they drive or do any type of burning. Let's hope it stays slow for fire crews and it is slow for some folks out there on the roads right now. I 35 at Martin. You can see that there's an emergency vehicle there on the inside lane. Look like a tow truck. We don't know if that was just a stalled vehicle that might be slowing things down, but the police crews are turning off its lights heading out of the area. So hopefully this little tie up here is going to get cleared up. But I 35 at Martin definitely traffic slow going at this point. Now still coming up after being on hold for nearly two years, the SA to DC City Council trip is back. You'll find out what council members hope to accomplish on their trip, and that's after the break. All right, so we have several stories that we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat with this. Yes, my friends, you recognize that with Fiesta only a week away. There's one last minute change. We're going to tell you how the war in Ukraine is now affecting the Battle of Flowers Parade. Also this, we've all seen the increase in prices, not only at the gas pump, but let's be honest, the grocery store too. So what does that mean for the San Antonio Food Bank and those who depend on it? We'll have that story and a lot more for you tonight on the night beat. San Antonio leaders heading to the Capitol next week, hoping to get every bit of federal funding that it can. This is the SA to DC trip organized by the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, typically an annual event, but the pandemic meant there was no 2021 trip. So now they're going back. Garrett Berger talked with him about their goals this time. 118 members of San Antonio's business community and local government headed to D.C. next week with one thing in mind. And at the end of the day, the goal is to bring money, resources, whether they're physical dollars or projects, to San Antonio, Texas. The group leaves Sunday, comes back Wednesday. The mornings will have speakers coming in to talk with them, whether local representatives, administration officials, or influencers from other states. Then they'll spread out and lobby across the Capitol. So yes, we're, then we just kind of spread out and then we'll caucus in the afternoon uh, for uh, a reception. And then there we begin, we go and, and try to press the flesh. It's the Chamber of Commerce's agenda that drives the trip. But city and county officials are coming along too. Federal agenda, so we're supportive of you know pretty much every single issue that's on the agenda. And again, it's a community collaborative effort. So With the bipartisan infrastructure bill out there, one big focus is on getting money for transportation. Uh, also relates to leveraging projects that we have in the bond, as well as our normal um, you know growth here in San Antonio, accommodating that through our transportation system. The chamber's president and CEO says they measure success by what they can bring back. The issues they bring could take years before they become a project. So sometimes they're longer term ways to measure, but uh, we do measure nonetheless. And like, again, the, the federal courthouse was on our legislative agenda for like eight years until we finally got it done. And there are other lobbying efforts going on outside of this trip, too. And if a project doesn't happen this year, they'll be back again next. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. 
talked about the wind, how that's been an issue today, but all in all, it's turned out to be a beautiful stretch of days we've had here, Adam. Well, it has. It's been enjoyable if you're visiting spring break mm -hmm. for the tournament as well, or just enjoying some outdoor activities. It's been very agreeable, especially with the lack of humidity in the air, because we know all summer long we would do anything for a break from that humidity like today, but it takes humidity to make rain. That's the flip side and we could use the rain. Calm wind tonight and tomorrow. You're not going to notice the wind. It's not going to be a factor. Another cool start to the day tomorrow. A good 10 degrees below average, but the key is we need rain. These days are enjoyable outside. They're nice, but we could use a good soaker. So let's talk about it. The newest drought monitor is in and unfortunately it's even worse news. That's not getting any better in our area. It's getting worse. Even exceptional drought, the highest category. Southwest of San Antonio, near Carrizo Springs, Southern Maverick County, Western Dimmick County. And then you get closer to San Antonio, we've got this severe to extreme drought, especially on the western portion of Bear County. But you go closer to Austin and even San Marcos area, and it's not as bad of a situation. That's where they've actually had some decent rainfall over the past few weeks. And as a state, as a whole, we've actually had a little bit of improvement from recent storm systems. Little bit. We were 91% in drought. Now we're 88% in drought. So kind of negligible, but either way, we need the rain around here and odds are not looking good for the foreseeable future. We're coming off a La Nina winter and typically these La Nina springs have a higher than average rate of severe storms, but a lower than average rate of good widespread rainfall. Here's what we have right now. Big Blue H over the Pacific, moving into the Baja Peninsula. That's going to be influencing our weather. We've got that ridge, which means sunny and dry conditions. Our next even chance of rain is near Alaska, similar to what we had, what we were watching last week. We went up to Alaska, saw that big swirl, watched it move our way, and it hit us this Monday. This system is going to approach us by Tuesday of next week. It's our next storm potential, but right now indications are that it's not going to be digging far enough south to really put us in the sweet spot. We'll be right on the tail edge and tail end of the activity. So we got We have us at a 30% chance. That's Tuesday night of next week. Otherwise looking dry and not even a chance of a shower here or there. So it's only Tuesday night. That's 30% right now. Let's talk temperatures and dry air. Dew point at 20, a very dry air in place. And there will be a little influx of humidity this weekend, but you're not going to notice it until next week. Temps across the state, mostly 70s, some 80s. Catula 85, Uvalde 81 right now. New Braunfels 79. Officially in San Antonio, we're at 79 degrees. And temperatures, as I mentioned, are going to be cooling off quickly very rapidly this evening. So get ready for temperatures tomorrow morning to start in the low to mid 40s for most of us. I mean, we're talking about 39 Bernie Timberwood Park in Bulverde, 41 Poteet, 43 in Converse, even Elmendorf about 42 degrees. And then by the afternoon, we get well into the 80s, even near 90 degrees, mid 80s in and around San Antonio, but off to the west 90. So one of those days, you feel a chill in the morning, but it's warm in the afternoon. So dressing in layers, light jacket in the morning. You won't need it by the noon hour and later on in the day, shorts and short sleeves just fine. Notice the light and variable wind. You won't even notice the breeze tonight or tomorrow, but you will come Sunday lasting all the way through Tuesday. Notice those highs staying in the 80s. All right, we wait for that rain. Thanks, Adam. Let's talk about the Spurs. If you're pop, you're telling the team, let's keep them three pointers coming because they were on fire. Yeah, Spurs. it's today's NBA. If you make a lot of three pointers, you're probably going to win the game. That's exactly what happened to the Spurs last night. Pop had to be thrilled with their three point shooting as they set a franchise record for threes in the first half. Plus, UTSA football certainly has several spots to fill this upcoming season coming up. Best part of the night beside us playing well, I guess, was seeing that Drew's doing well, uh, and again getting to see Damian, uh, who was a, a great leader for us uh, at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Pop made sure to hug and talk with Damian Lillard during post-game handshakes last night in Big Board Sports. 
After trailing the Blazers by seven points early on, 9-2, the Spurs cranked out a 13-0 run to take the lead for good, and from there they beat down the Blazers 133-96. Five Spurs scored in double figures, led by DeJounte Murray in his game-best 28 points. Kelvin Johnson was next with 26. San Antonio led 81-53 at halftime. It was the most points in any half of the team this season, and they had 13 three-pointers in the first half, which is a new franchise record, but Portland was down seven players, including their two leading scorers, Damian Lillard and Josh Hart, which Pop was quick to point out during postgame. You know, this obviously wasn't a fair fight. Uh, we got a lot of guys out, uh, but the good part for us was that uh, we still played good basketball. We didn't uh, think that we could just walk out there and win. We played to win and, and got it done, but uh, we realized that uh, you know, they're obviously far from full strength. For the game, San Antonio made 19 three-pointers, matching their season high just one shy of their franchise record. Six different Spurs made a shot from downtown, led by Keldon, who made five of them. We got players who could, who could you know, shoot the three. Um, I've seen I see them work out and practice every day and shoot around. And I mean, we have a lot of people that can shoot, so when we're open, you know, that's a great shot to take. Five. Former Spurs Drew Eubanks led the Blazers last night with 20 points and nine rebounds. You can tell the Spurs really enjoyed seeing him. Spurs will next play Saturday, 4 p.m. at New Orleans. UTSA football is working hard as they get ready for the new season to start September 3rd at home with the Houston Cougars. UTSA has a lot of work to do between now and then, though, and they'll have plenty of spots to fill. <clears throat> excuse me, with the guys like Sincere McCormick, Spencer Burford, and Tariq Woolen moving on, among others. The Roadrunners will scrimmage on Saturday, which is another step in figuring out that brand new depth chart. Who's the left tackle? I mean, who is the will? You know, who's that corner going to be? Who's the running back? Right? We got some, who's the kicker? We got real questions. Who are the backups? Because we, you know, Dom Pasucci came back as a backup last year. Jalen came back as a backup for us last year. We lost some really good backups too, not just starters. So those are the questions that had to be answered. And uh, it's why it's fun to coach. It's why it's fun to be here. It's a great job. And uh, we're, we're, it's a blessing. 32nd year and still a blessing to try to figure all this stuff out. Left tackle Spencer Burford, who's leaving for the NFL, took part in the Roadrunners Pro Day yesterday. This after he showed off his skills during the NFL scouting combine a couple of weeks ago. Going through the drills for the NFL teams is cool, but it's also a grind. It's been a mental grind, not going to lie to you. A mental and physical grind, but more mental than anything. So it's a lot of things that come with it that sometimes a lot of people might know about, but actually going through it is a whole totally different thing. And it's being reported by Pro Football Network, the Saints worked out Burford and Tariq Woolen. All right, okay. good stuff. We'll see. Yep. Thanks, Larry. Up next, we're going to talk about tuberculosis. It's still a thing, believe it or not, that we're <laughs> discussing uh, in San Antonio and how COVID has it, it had an impact on it. We're going to talk about that in case that's Q&A. Welcome back. San Antonio will soon be home to a new National Tuberculosis Research Center. It's a new designation for Texas Biomedical Research Institute on the west side. If you're wondering why that's important or even have questions about what tuberculosis is, is that still a disease that affects a lot of people? We're going to talk about all of that in today's KSAT Q&A. We are joined by Dr. Joanne Turner, the Executive Vice President of Research at Texas Biomed. Dr. Turner, thank you so much for spending some time here with us this evening. Let's first talk about what this designation means for Texas Biomed. How will it affect the work you all do? Well, it really uh, brings a new project to our campus and also something new to San Antonio, where we will be training the next generation of scientists that will study tuberculosis and do that in a way that gives them a very interdisciplinary training so they can really tackle the, the really, really important problems we have that slow down our ability to cure or treat this disease. So let's kind of take it a step back here and just for people who are you know, joining us or they have questions about TB, what exactly is tuberculosis? It's a disease called, caused by a bacteria and that bacteria typically enters the lung uh, and you know, makes a residence there in our lung. And for some people there are no symptoms of disease and in others that bacteria continues to grow um, it can cause significant lung disease, lots of coughing, uh, a lot of weight loss. Um, and if un left untreated, it can actually lead to death. 
you know, of course, we've spent the last two years talking about COVID and mm -hmm. how that has been the primary focus when it comes to health and contagious diseases across this country and the world. But is tuberculosis still something that is really impacting people? I mean, is this is this fatal for a lot of people? It's a significant problem for a lot of people. We have about uh, 10 million new infections every year globally. We have a million deaths from tuberculosis every year. Um, and we have TB in the US. Uh, so we have more than 10 million individuals who are infected, not necessarily sick, uh, but infected with this bacteria. So it's an ongoing problem. It's definitely here in Texas in some areas, particularly around the border. Uh, and it's something that we continue to struggle to treat effectively. And how do you compare uh, TB to to COVID, obviously, because that's a COVID is a virus that we're a lot more familiar with. So I just feel like that's a good reference point for people to understand. How is TB different? Is it deadlier? Is it more dangerous? What are the symptoms? Um, it's definitely been around for longer. So it is a pandemic, just like we think of COVID as being a pandemic. Um, it's a pathogen that likes to live in the lung and cause lung disease. Um, and can cause a lot of significant death. What you see the difference in is often the timing. Uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 is very acute, uh, gets into the lung and makes you sick very quickly. The bacteria that causes TB tends to be much more slow growing, um, and it really will become a problem over time in an individual. But essentially, they're the same public health concerns um, transmitted primarily through breathing uh, and causing significant lung disease. Where does this bacteria come from? I mean, is it something that it spreads from person to person? You have to be in certain environments to pick this up? It does spread mostly from person to person and through um, particles that we might breathe out or cough or sneeze. Uh, that's really the best way for transmission for this bacteria. It can also live in the environment for some time. So we discussed how uh, us having a designation here as a national TB research center uh, with Texas Biomed. Is there any benefit to the people here? Uh, I think there would be. So we're essentially training scientists on our campus and scientists down uh, in the clinics near the U.S.-Mexico border and here in San Antonio in our own uh, TB hospital in San Antonio. And so um, it does bring new um, individuals to work at our institute. So there's some employment opportunities some training opportunities. And it also really highlights uh, some of the strengths of San Antonio. We're a really strong biomedical culture in San Antonio. And this adds to that and really creates this wonderful education initiative that we can talk about uh, citywide. We've reported on the fact that Texas Biomed, you know, when the pandemic began, you all shifted everything to really focus on COVID-19, understanding the, the disease itself, and then, of course, moving on to later understanding how the vaccine would affect animals and then later on uh, humans. So talk about how COVID had an impact on tuberculosis, because since there was such a heavy focus over the last two years on COVID, we know that other illnesses just haven't been getting the attention that they used to. Exactly. And uh, for Texas Biomed, we had so many researchers studying tuberculosis that have the skills needed to study uh, SARS-CoV-2. That was a plus for us. We could quickly pivot and work with this virus. Um, but um, nationally and internationally, COVID has distracted from TB treatment. So individuals may not get the hospital care that they need. They may be unable to get to the hospital or the clinics are really just full of treating individuals with very severe COVID-19. Um, and because of that, they either haven't been diagnosed quickly, so they've been able to spread it to others in their community, um, or they've really just got sicker and ended up being hospitalized. And so it, the numbers uh, have increased since we've been in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, TB numbers have definitely increased, mm -hmm. so it has an impact on it. Okay, Dr. Joanne Turner, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Dr. Joanne Turner of Texas Biomed. Thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A popular voice is back on the FM airwaves in San Antonio. RJ Marquez telling us about how Johnny Ramirez's new morning gig is shaping up and how a rebranded radio station is spinning Tejano into a new era. Tejano Music is back on the FM dial across the city of San Antonio. We visited with the one and only Johnny Ramirez to tell us more about Tejano 95.7 and find out about the future of this music genre. Thank you so much for checking out Tejano 95.7. Johnny Ramirez is back in the booth for the rebranded 95.7 FM. 
Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to come into your homes, your car. The station recently switched from La Ley to an all-dedicated Tejano station, giving the sound of San Antonio a citywide signal. It's important that, you know, especially San Antonio has a, uh, a city that you can hear if you're on the north, south, east, west side, everywhere. The Hano 95.7 just launched in March, bringing back the longtime San Antonio DJ for its morning drive. Ramita says he's ready to spin the classics and also introduce listeners to a new generation of the Hano music. There's so many young artists that are hungry to bring Tejano back to the airwaves. Ramirez says it's all about connecting to the community that makes us the Tejano capital of the world. It's who we are. It's part of our culture, part of our tradition, part of our heritage. And with this switch, Ramirez hopes Tejano music continues its recent rebirth. You never know what, what you're missing until it's gone, and then all of a sudden you're going, what happened? Uh, well, what happened is, you know, Tejano is back on the FM dial, so, and hopefully it's here to stay. And R.J. Marquez, KSAT 12 News. All right, now we're going to take a live look outside at our live cam here, getting a live look at 410, where you can see in the distance there, traffic is flowing really nicely. It's a beautiful time of day, 640, 79 degrees right now. A lot of people love this time of year because, you know, it's just not that hot and the mornings are cool, and that's what we've been having, Adam. Yeah, we have. Actually, mornings have been running below average. That trend will be changing, though, soon. Tomorrow morning, you'll notice the chill in the air. I mean, we're 79 right now, and by 10 o'clock, we'll be down near 60 degrees. So the cool is going to creep up on us again tonight. We'll talk about the changes temperature wise and how they're going to affect the weekend along with lake levels. That's something we haven't visited in a while. We're going to take a look at those in a bit. All right, in the buzz today, Beyond Meat unveiling its plant-based jerky. How's that possible? Well, it's how are a lot of things possible with this? Okay, yeah. the company has already replaced meat with its hamburgers, sausages, meatballs, and chicken. So now, of course, they've moved to jerky. Officials say that there are currently three flavors here, original, teriyaki, and hot and spicy. All right, I think I would try the teriyaki first. All right, so just like beef jerky, those vegetarian-friendly options are now marinated and also slow-roasted. But instead of meat, they're made from ingredients like peas, beans, things like that. Customers interested in checking out Beyond Meat Jerky will be able to find them in all places where you can find traditional jerky. Maybe we Something would to look be out for. pleasantly surprised. This is true, yeah. All right, so time to dig into a Philadelphia tradition. It is National Cheese Steak Day. We're talking about the amazing combination of, you know, beef, cheese, onions on a hoagie. Now, I would assume you know a good one, right? This is so true. you've worked in Philadelphia yeah. before. Yeah. Okay. So you can celebrate this day by getting a cheesesteak at a restaurant, of course, making one yourself at home. Post your meal on social media with the hashtag National Cheesesteak Day. Fun fact here, Philadelphia hot dog vendors Pat and Harry Oliveri are credited with inventing the cheesesteak back in the 19th. 30s. And let me tell you, Philadelphians take that really seriously. In fact, just in, if you're ever in Philadelphia, you should read up on like etiquette when you're ordering a cheesesteak ah. because people get very angry if you use the wrong oh. language. Interesting. Just say it. It's like a thing. So. Who knew? I see. Wow. Now you know. Okay. That is interesting. <laughs> it's kind of like in New Orleans when you order a, a po' boy. I did not know the terminology there either. I'll have to talk to you about that. Okay. okay. I got a few tips. Never I love this. Though. Next thing we're going to be talking Kishka, you know, blood sausage. That's going to be you to... talking Kishka. Because <laughs> even after favorite. all these years, I haven't really learned all that. Uh, I've got a few rings in my freezer. I've been meaning to bring some. I don't know if you would, you would definitely try it. I know you would. <laughs> I know you would. Because otherwise you'd feel bad, right? You'd have to try it. Oh, so it's my guilt that's yep. making me. <laughs> okay, okay. You're probably right. Uh-huh, right? You'd love it. Near 80 degrees right now. Dew point of 20, so dry air. It's still warm right now, but with that dry air, temperatures are going to fall off quickly. Clear sky, a calming wind, a dry air. Woo, temperatures fall off fast. So by midnight, we're in the mid 50s and early tomorrow morning, 44 degrees downtown and even cooler in some outlying areas. And our morning temperature trend will be going upward again but not tomorrow. It's going to be a gradual process through the weekend. And actually the weekend's going to be near average. And then early next week, morning temperatures will be back above average, closer to 60 degrees. All right, let's take a look at some of those readings. And we're well into the 80s south and west of San Antonio in the typically warmer locations as you get 
down into Pleasanton, Hondo, even 82 degrees, Catula 85, Del Rio right now at 84 degrees. Stinson's still hanging on to 83, but Converse is 79 and 78 in comfort. Fairly similar temperatures all across the metro area. But tomorrow morning, we're going to see some upper 30s again. We're thinking Bernie, Timberwood Park, Bulverde, maybe even Leon Springs, about 39 degrees for the morning temperature. Bandera, Pipe Creek, 39, Rio Medina, 41, within 410, about 43, 44. So a bit of a chill in the air early, but it's not going to last long. We're going to warm up quickly and well into the 80s. We're talking mid to upper 80s by tomorrow afternoon. West of town, even 90. Hondo, Sabinal, Uvalde, 90 degrees for the high temperature. So yeah, maybe long sleeves very early and briefly in the morning, but the rest of the day, shorts and short sleeves, A-OK. -okay. And we're going to see a similar trend for high temperatures in that 80 degree range all the way through the weekend. We need rain. It's been dry. We haven't checked out reservoir levels, so let's take, revisit them. Medina, 22% full. That's 50 feet below the conservation pool. Canyon, usually more of a stable lake level, a 98% full, and that's one foot below the conservation pool. Choke at 41%, and that's 20 feet below. You get the idea. We could use some good rain. Here's our weather pattern, and it's not all that promising right now. Not even a cloud in the sky across the Lone Star State. You look off to the west, what's coming our way? Big upper level high pressure system just south of Los Angeles, big blue H. That gives us sunny and dry conditions. That's going to be influencing our weather through Monday. Our next system, which is going to approach on Tuesday, that's over Alaska right now. That swirl, that upper disturbance is going to drop our way. And it's going to give, I think, parts of Texas some good rain just not necessarily our part of Texas. And you look at the seasonal outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, and they have Texas and even South and Central Texas in the category where odds favor below average pr precipitation through April, May, and June. We're coming off a La Nina winter. Typically around here, those La Nina springs have a higher than average occurrence of little severe storms, but lower than average actual widespread soaking rainfall. 44 degrees in the morning tomorrow, sunny and dry all day, low humidity, but finally you're not going to notice the wind. So no red flag warning in effect for tomorrow. That's a bonus, but remember we're still dry out there. And then into the weekend, high temperatures still in the 80s, a lot of sunshine. You'll notice that wind, the wind again by Sunday, even Monday and Tuesday, some gusty winds. And then Tuesday night, just that 30% chance of some thunderstorms. You almost forgot over there, didn't you? No, huh? no, no, not at all. <laughs> it is Thursday, and it's almost Fiesta too. So I've been uh, my next medal giveaway is Tuesday of next week. I've been uh, pulling some late nights, making extra thermometers to be drawing oh, names good for stuff. for my. Okay. And we'll talk about where that's going to be uh, on Monday. We'll get into those details. But I've been talking about this thermometer, uh, barometer, and hygrometer combination. You know, nice ornamental and very functional instrument cluster, but the thermometer was broken on it. So last week we talked about how I pulled off the old broken panel, uh, old thermometer scale and thermometer. And then I take my glass. This is capillary tubing. And I'm going to take you step by step through this process. And what I do is I score the glass. I measure it out to size and I score it with my file and then I snap it and then it should be the proper length of what I'm looking for for the given you know backboard usually the ones I make are six inches this one I'm making about nine and three quarters uh, to fit that spot to fill in the blank of where we had the broken thermometer okay we're going to talk more about this again later but uh, next week and of course in the coming weeks we've got our winner this week from San Antonio, boom, Gail Zair of San Antonio. The Gail that I sent the email to and already heard back from. Congratulations. <laughs> KSAT.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. Go Gail. Gail is on top of it. Yes, and that is her thermometer right there. Good right. stuff. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next.
Good morning to you. It's Thursday, March 24th. And now we begin with breaking news. We've just learned that the family of Gilbert Flores, who was shot and killed by BCSO deputies, is being awarded over $10 million. This comes three days after testimony. The jury siding with the family of Gilbert Flores, saying deputies used excessive force in the case. Flores was fatally shot outside of his northwest side home by deputies. This bird's eye view of large grass fires puts into perspective how fast and far flames can spread once they hit dry grass, which essentially acts as fuel. Bear County and most of Texas are in extreme drought conditions. And to make matters worse, we have a red flag warning with 10 to 20 mile per hour winds with gusts of 30 miles per hour possible until 7 tonight. Learning more about the two people who were killed in a crash on I-35 yesterday. Both of them were men. One was 22, the other was 42 years old. Police are telling us that nine people were in that SUV that crashed yesterday morning. Happened along the entrance ramp to Interstate 35 North at North Walter Street. Investigators say that the car's driver was trying to avoid being pulled over when they crossed two traffic lanes and right there hit a guardrail. A deadly and fiery crash this morning. It happened on the city's northeast side at around 2.30 on the northeast Loop 410 area. Police say that they're still trying to figure out what went wrong here. They say that the victim was traveling north when their vehicle went off the road. It then drove through a center grassy median, went down an embankment, and then struck a wall at the Ritterman Road exit. After all of this, the vehicle caught fire. Thanks for watching. We'll see you at 10.